Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us for the 38th webinar in the Offshore Wind Series, Learning from the Experts. I'm Greg Randolph, Managing Director at the New York Green Bank. It's my pleasure to be joined uh, by today's experts. Leslie Hunter with the American Council on Renewable Energy, known as ACOR, and Chris Gladback with McDermott, Will, and Emery. Before I introduce Leslie and Chris, a few reminders for the participants and some background on this webinar series. Uh, next slide, please. Um, firstly, if you're experiencing any technical issues, please contact John Nukroto uh, at the email address at the bottom of the slide. This webinar is being recorded and the recordings and presentation slides for all webinars in this in the Learning from Experts series are available on ICERTA's website at the address on the slide. All participants have been muted. We will continue. Uh, we will have time for Q&A following the presentation, so please use the Q&A functions to submit your questions from the, speak from the speaker. Next slide, please. New York State is working to advance the responsible and cost-effective development of at least 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035. Offshore wind is, is a critical component in achieving the state's goals of 70% renewable sources of electricity by 2030 and 100% zero emissions electricity by 2040. While offshore wind has been providing clean energy to other parts of the world for several decades, this industry is brand new to New Yorkers. To provide interested stakeholders and members of the public with accessible and partial information and opportunities for engagement on specific topics, ICERTA is hosting this educational series called Learning from the Experts to connect the public with independent experts and key topics in offshore wind. We endeavor to collect learning from the experts speakers based on the, their expertise, not necessarily for an alignment of opinions with NYSERDA or New York State. If you'd like to suggest a topic or speaker for a future webinar, you can email us at offshorewind at nyserta.ny.gov or fill out a survey also available on our website. Please note that the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the presenters. Next slide, please. It is now my pleasure to introduce Leslie Hunter and Chris Galatikak. Leslie is Senior Vice President of Programs and Sustainable Finance. She provides strategic leadership and oversight to ACORS programs and analysis. She leads ACOR's Environmental Social uh, in Governance Working Group and ACOR's Project Finance Working Group. She is also the author of numerous reports on renewable energy, finance, and policy issues. Chris counsels clients in the energy M&A, project development, tax equity, and project finance transactions. Chris works with energy clients in structuring complex equity and debt investments, advises both buyers and sellers, in the power sector and mergers and acquisitions and joint ventures and on the development of large-scale energy projects. Thank you and I will now hand it over to our speakers. Thank you Greg and also want to thank um, NYSERDA for, for hosting this. So today uh, Chris and I look forward to discussing the current environment for offshore wind project finance in the context of evolving market conditions. Uh, next slide please. So ACOR is a nonprofit organization that works to open markets for the clean energy transition. Um, at ACOR, I work with our membership of investors, corporations, developers, and, and others on project finance and ESG related issues to support the rapid scaling of renewable energy investments. Next slide. So we believe um, offshore wind uh, will play a crucial role in power sector decarbonization through its large scaling potential and strong capacity factor. Um, yet the, the US market is still in the process of opening up. So as, as you can see from the slide here, we've attracted around 5.5 billion in offshore wind project finance investments over the past several years. And the majority of this was in uh, 2021 for the Vineyard Wind project that's currently under construction. By comparison, the total renewable energy market typically attracts around 50 billion annually. So over the next decade, as we work to meet um, the, 
administration's target of 30 gigawatts by 2030 will need to significantly increase private sector investments in this decade. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just looking um, on how we are um, toward meeting this, this target, uh, uh, recent analysis from Bloomberg NEF anticipates that U.S. is on track to achieving 23 gigawatts of the, the 30 gigawatt target, um, citing uh, recent development such as contract renegotiations and other sector headwinds, uh, which we'll be talking about on this webinar, leading to some recent adjustments and forecasts. Next slide, please. So New York in particular is aiming for um, nine gigawatts of, uh, of uh, offshore wind capacity. And as you see here, some of the projects under development are currently being renegotiated. However, um, as you many of you probably saw yesterday, um, New York just announced the largest ever state investment um, in offshore wind, selecting three um, offshore projects um, that together exceed four gigawatts in capacity. And we're really excited to see what's next on that front. Next slide. So um, investors are, are prepared to allocate capital to the offshore wind sector. Um, ACOR, uh, conducts surveys annually uh, to gauge uh, investor interest in various U.S. clean uh, energy sectors. And our survey from this year, offshore wind um, emerged as the fifth most attractive sector for investment. So a bit behind the more developed onshore sectors, but still attracting immense interest from the investment community. Next slide. So um, a typical project financing structure for an offshore wind project generally looks like financing for an onshore uh, project and usually will involve a tax equity partnership, cash equity investments, and debt financing. And these all make up what we call the, the project capital stack. Um, we use the structure and, and tax equity because of how uh, clean energy projects are incentivized through the federal tax credits, the protection tax credit and the investment tax credit, um, which have been the most significant drivers of clean energy growth over the past two decades. Um, project developers do not typically have the tax capacity, however, to use these tax credits. So they usually sell the tax credits and other benefits to a tax equity investor through a project partnership, which is, um, and these uh, tax equity investors are typically large tax pay paying corporations, um, such as banks. Uh, tax equity can provide around half of the, the capital stack for an offshore wind project. And um, the IRA now provides alternative financing options to monetize tax credits outside of traditional um, tax equity, um, including through transferability and direct pay provisions. A transferability allows investors to purchase tax credits without entering into a more structured tax equity partnership and has the potential to significantly increase the number of investors in the market. Um, direct pay allows certain tax exempt entities to receive tax credits as payments if they meet certain criteria. Um, and Chris will provide more information about these uh, financing structures um, during his presentation. But I did want to uh, point you to this uh, slide here. Um, this is another result from our recent surveys that show investors and developers um, observations, expectations for the availability of different financing sources in the market over the next three years. So tax equity ranks highly, um, will continue to be an important project financing source, um, and then transferability um, will play a significant role in the market as well. So next slide. So um, looking at the Inflation Reduction Act, so this has created new opportunities for sector growth across, across the clean energy sector, but in particular for, for offshore wind as well. Um, it extended the, the full value um, ITC and, and PTC, the tax credits for clean energy technologies until 2025. Um, well, beyond that, these credits will become technology neutral until carbon emissions are at 25% of 2022 levels. The primary um, tax provision supporting offshore wind is the ITC, which offers a 30% tax credit for offshore wind projects um, 
that uh, based on the, the total system cost. So these facilities, um, however, must pay uh, prevailing wages and meet registered apprenticeship requirements to qualify for the full credit. Additionally, there are now um, bonus credits um, that can be stacked on top, such as the domestic content bonus, low income bonus, and energy community bonus credits of um, 10%. These bonus credits can uh, play an important role in attracting um, more tax equity to support the high capital costs of offshore wind projects. Um, lastly, I'll, I'll just mention that the Department of Energy's Loan Programs Office, um, or the LPO, has expanded loan authority through the IRA. It can provide additional financing to um, certain clean energy projects for up to 80% of eligible project costs. And ICERTA and LPO now have an MOU to accelerate financing for large scale projects, including offshore wind. Uh, next slide. So, just to touch on some of the key headwinds facing offshore wind um, and how they're uh, affecting project financing, um, I'll start with supply chain issues. So, ongoing supply chain uh, disruptions continue as. Um, you know, stemmed from the war in Ukraine and COVID, ongoing uh, COVID-related delays. Um, of course, these have been observed across the clean ener energy supply chain and are adding um, further financial difficulties for the offshore wind sector. Um, fortunately, there have been several announcements to build uh, domestic onshore wind uh, manufacturing facilities over the past year. Um, and uh, this is incentivized by um, federal incentives, and hopefully this will relieve um, some of the constraints on supply chain. Um, on LCOE, so that stands for the levelized costs of, of energy, uh, but when it comes to costs, offshore wind projects uh, typically require substanti substantial upfront investments um, that often exceed $1 billion. Um, the LCOE, or which is the cost of operating a project through its lifetime, um, the LCOE for subsidized um, U.S. offshore wind projects has increased almost 50 percent from 2021 levels, and this is due to um, rising capital and operational expenditure um, costs, uh, higher capital costs, and other changes in macroeconomic conditions. So these factors have prompted developers to renegotiate uh, power purchase agreements that they have with off takers um, and then leading to concerns about project finance uh, viability and also to some project cancellations. Um, transmission, of, of course, also remains a major concern for offshore wind. Under uh, current processes, it takes at least a decade to plan and build new um, transmission lines. Um, also, the lengthy interconnection queues to connect um, new projects to the grid are creating additional delays and uncertainty. Um, I'll point out that ACOR released a report earlier this, this year that calls for urgency around uh, planning for offshore wind uh, transmission infrastructure. Um, on permitting, uh, developers must secure uh, multiple federal, state, and local permits to proceed with construction. They often do not lock in supply agreements until they're close to securing uh, these permits. And uh, therefore, permitting delays expose projects to macroeconomic challenges for a longer period than um, onshore projects. And this leads to increased costs for developers, again, uh, potentially affecting the project viability and increasing financial risks. Um, also mentioned that the companies have recently noted um, concerns around their ability to qualify for the IRA bonus credits that I just mentioned for using uh, domestic content, for example. Um, so with already high costs for the projects and inability to secure these bonus credits could lead to less value on the tax equity projects and also um, uh, affect um, project um, from moving forward. Um, if we could go to the next slide here. And this, this slide just shows the, the increase in LCOE, LCOE since 2021. You can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so, and, and the last challenge I'll just mention is um, that, you know, there's a growing need for tax equity as, as we've discussed. Um, we project that the IRA will create um, 
demand for about $50 billion um, dollars per year in uh, tax equity. We're currently in a market that provides about $20 billion a year. So we'll need to expand existing investors in the sector and attract new investors um, to help realize the IRA's potential, in particular for offshore wind. Um, there are some new banking regulations and, um, you know, top up taxes um, that can be imposed in other jurisdictions through the OECD that could limit the scale of um, tax equity investments in the market and the amount of players who are active. Um, we at ACOR are working actively across our membership to get the policy changes needed to help minimize their impacts. Um, and also transferability and direct play. Pay will play a big role in, in helping to fill in the, for the additional um, demand for, for tax equity here, but um, time will just kind of um, tell, you know, we'll need more time to tell how um, they will work out in the market, but there's a lot of opportunity. So um, there's, uh, if we could go to the, the next slide. So um, the offshore wind industry has immense potential here for a nation's offshore, offshore or for our nation's power market. Investors are interested, uh, but of course, the sector must confront some of these headwinds to take advantage of financing opportunities. So I'll now uh, pass it over to Chris for a more granular take on financing structures. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, if I could see uh, the next slide. Um, so this is uh, going to be an introduction to um, project finance in the offshore wind space. Um, and frankly, there hasn't been that much of it, but uh, uh, but there's a lot to uh, digest here. And so um, let's, let's dive right in. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we're gonna talk a bit about how project finance works and how developers and sponsors are thinking about financing their offshore wind projects. We're gonna talk about some of the market conditions that are affecting the development uh, and ultimate financing of these projects. And then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, uh, so if you could get some questions in, uh, we'll be happy to sort through those and see which ones um, we can answer and, and have time for. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are we talking about when we're talking about project finance and what is required from a project sponsor to get to a place where a financial institution might want to lend money ultimately to construct an offshore wind facility? Well, in the offshore wind space, much like the onshore wind space, um, you have to get everything ready. <laughs> and what I mean is you've got to have site control. So in the offshore wind space, that means uh, getting a lease from Boehm. Uh, you have to have the correct permits. Um, you have to uh, engage um, in um, obtaining all of your project contracts, so your construction contracts, and ultimately your operation and maintenance contracts and your supply contracts. You have to get interconnection. You have to have transmission and interconnection in order to plug your project into the electrical grid. Um, and ultimately you should um, have a power purchase agreement or an agreement for the purchase of specialized uh, uh, renewable energy credits, which are sort of a, um, uh, a product that are created by regulatory um, fiat, which basically entitle um, uh, you know, utilities that buy those credits uh, or governmental entities that buy those credits uh, to uh, you know, claim credit for the renewable uh, aspect of power, usually corresponding to sort of one megawatt of power, one megawatt hour of credit. Um, so you should have offtake, and that's the, the most important point because that's the um, that's the principal revenue source that um, is going to support the project. Um, in addition to those things that Leslie mentioned, um, tax equity. 
So that you, you get all that stuff. You get in a place where your product is fully quote developed. Um, and then you approach financial institutions. Um, and so financial institutions want to see everything ready to go uh, for construction, but they want one other thing and they want um, uh, next next slide. They 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 want um, uh, they want tax equity uh, to be in place if you're getting construction loan, so that that construction loan is is repaid, typically by a combination of tax equity and uh, and and cash equity, an ultimate owner of the project. So so the bank loans money um, to the project company, um, and uh, as collateral for the bank's money, the bank takes a security interest in the project company uh, assets uh, and the project company itself, typically. And, and again, the bank is looking for the source of repayment. Uh, typically, when I say bank, it's typically in these offshore wind projects, it's typically a consortium, uh, a, a large syndicate of banks, um, that are participating because of the size of, uh, uh, of, of some of these financings, as Leslie said, um, you know, they can be in, in the billions. So usually it's, it's a number of banks, uh, with, with a lead bank sort of taking the role of, uh, um, negotiating the, the documents and leading the diligence efforts. Um, next slide, please. So when I say what, what are. The financial institutions are looking to get repaid and they're looking to make some interest uh, on their um, on their advances. Uh, and so what what are um, the sources of ultimate repayment? Well, the immediate source of repayment, which is why construction financing is often talked about um, as a bridge financing, um, is is this tax equity uh, 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 investment that is uh, in most cases gonna come in uh, if you're getting the ITC between uh, mechanical completion and substantial completion of the project. And that's a large portion of the repayment. Um, and we talked about, you know, the, the another source of repayment for, um, uh, for investors in the project are, you know, sale of power, um, sale of RECs, renewable energy credits, potentially capacity payments, if, if the market provides for that, um, uh, uh, potentially um, performance guarantees from the O&M provider. So the O&M provider, the operation maintenance provider might say, okay, um, uh, wind farm, you're going to generate at, you know, X amount of projected production and if you don't generate it at that level, we're going to sort of cover you for uh, some of the shortfall. So that potentially could be a source of repayment um, and other revenue. Yeah, so there's there's also sort of local incentives, um, whether those are tax incentives, whether those are you know direct subsidy, subsidies or indirect subsidies. And so those those are all the sources of potential repayment for um, you know ultimately the financing, but then but then um potentially a term financing if it's converted at uh uh at cod um next slide please um so we talked about what needs to be in place what needs to be in place in order for financial institutions to get comfortable with um ultimately the financing of the construction um one piece of that is um having the appropriate project contracts um, uh, that the institution is is comfortable with the counterparties of those contracts, that those counterparties are credit worthy, that they have experience, that they're quote bankable. Um, so in wind projects, um, uh, unlike some other power projects where you might have a what is known as a full wrap um, uh, EPC um uh engineering procurement and construction contract uh here um 
it's it's more likely that your project sponsor and your and your project company ultimately are going to be contracting with various uh, counterparties. So they may have a turbine supply agreement. Um, they may have a um, balance of plan agreement for offshore. They're going to have agreements with um, uh, the vessels. Um, uh, and there's numerous other uh, uh, pieces that can get broken up, you know, the cables and and other pieces. So, um, so that's a bit unlike by, you know, building a gas plant, for example. Um, and it, what it takes is uh, a pretty experienced project sponsor and a project sponsor that really understands um, the various components uh, that make up the, uh, the system. Um, but from a bank perspective, from a diligence perspective, um, uh, financial institutions are going to want to understand what happens if something, you know, goes wrong. So, for example, what happens if um, there's a problem uh, and the turbine supplier and, and the balance of plant contractor um, both are pointing fingers at each other and saying, you know, you're actually the one that messed up here. Um, what, 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 who, who uh, ensures, you know, the gap there and is there a gap? Um, and so that that's one of the questions that might get brought up in diligence when you start to kind of parse out different pieces of construction. Um, uh, so that's that's going to be very important to understand the contractual structure. Um, and we talked about you know the credit profile of the contractors. That's of course important because again, if something goes wrong. Um, you're going to want to have rec these are huge projects, billions of dollars. You're going to want to have recourse against the contractor that is supplying or building uh, that piece of equipment or component or service. Um, and you want that contractor to have a, lar a large balance sheet or to be supported by someone that has a large balance sheet so that you can you can you can recover if there's an issue um, um, and of course if you're a lender to a uh, offshore wind project and the offshore wind project is not going well and there's an event of default under the um, uh, under the loan agreement and there's just no way to work it out with the sponsor and you have to step in you have to foreclose on the project you know, I, my partner used to used to say a long term partner of mine used to say project finance is a lot like a watch that is wound. What does that mean? Well, if you sort of wind the watch up uh, and let it run, um, it should run on its own. Um, and so um, when a lender steps in, uh, you know, God forbid, and forecloses on a project, they want the ability to really enforce uh, the contracts, really have a robust um, uh, project that is not dependent uh, uh, ultimately on sponsor ownership. Now, sponsor ownership is important and the credit worthiness of the sponsor is important, especially since this is a new technology um, <clears throat> for the United States. And so that's all important. Um, track record is important, as I say in the slide. But ultimately, the source of repayment, in addition to all those things um, uh, that I mentioned, you know, comes from the project itself. And that's that's uh, why we say it's project finance as opposed to corporate finance, um, because that's the uh, that's the ultimate way that the financing parties get paid. Um, so all those all those pieces have to work. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, what does a financing party look at when they look at a wind project, an offshore wind project? Um, one thing they they one thing they're they're going to be very keen on understanding is um, if um, 
uh, pricing is is locked down uh, for the project. So, you know, for example, I mentioned commodity price. They're also going to want to understand um, whether there's any um, uh, risk that um, there's going to be a change in law that could affect uh, the viability of the project or um, the ultimate take out of the project, which again, a large part is tax equity. And by the way, when I say take out, what I mean is a source of repayment, a large, a large source of repayment. Um, so they're, they're going to want to understand those things. They're going to want to talk. They're going to want to understand the structure of the contracts, the allocation of risk in the contracts, whether there's any abnormal risks in the contracts that need to get covered somewhere. Um, and, and in offshore wind, since it's very new technology for the United States, again, not elsewhere, but for the United States, there's going to be more scrutiny uh, on the quality of counterparties, more scrutiny on the track record of the sponsor, uh, more scrutiny on making sure that the permits, including the federal permits, are sort of tied up with the bow. All, all those things have to be in place um, and appropriately addressed. Next slide. Um, other pieces that financing parties might look at. Um, production estimates of, uh, of, of wind. Excuse me, sorry for that. Um, production estimates of of wind. Um, financing parties are going to want to understand um, who's providing those estimates and if those um, uh, engineers what their track record is, um, and they're going to want to understand you know what the base case uh, level of production is and um, what the ultimate downside case is. So people talk about P99s and P50s. You know, the, P, the P50 is the production estimate that will occur 50% of the time. And P99 is, the, is, is, is what, the, what the farm is going to achieve from a production perspective 99% of the time. And so, uh, you know, early days of project finance, people would talk about, well, you're, you're, you're financing a, a base case you know, somewhere between P50 and P99. Um, and what does that mean? Why do you care about the production estimates? Well, that's your source of revenue, right? Because, you know, in addition to the tax, tax credits, um, uh, you need to, uh, you've got, you know, a price per megawatt hour. And so production, of course, is, is very important. We talked, we talked about technology. Um, it's it's going to be very important from a diligence perspective to, understand who's providing the technology, what kind of credit they have, what the design is going to be. You know, it's very interesting in offshore wind because it seems like the design for these wind turbines is is changing all the time. And, um, you know, project plans that were submitted, uh, I I see we have some people from Boehm, Boehm on the line, project plans that were submitted to, to Boehm on a number of these projects you know, which had, uh, I don't know, uh, eight megawatt, 10 megawatt turbines now are featuring 20 megawatt turbines or higher. Uh, the turbines are getting bigger and they're able to produce more power and you're able to get larger wind farms. Well, with, with those turbines getting bigger um, uh, and with that technology improving all the time comes sort of new questions about uh, uh, track record of those turbines and have all the kinks been worked out in, in those particular turbines? And if not, who is the entity essentially standing behind the performance of, of those turbines? And so, so financing parties want to understand that uh, um, and they want to get their heads around it. Uh, we talked about um, uh, all the man management of all the different pieces of uh, of the construction and how that's getting managed and the issue of kind of gap coverage. If, you know, again, one supplier is, is pointing at the other one, who's, who's stepping in the gap. Um, uh, uh, questions about who's covering the operation. Want to understand that 
Are there any issues related to environmental matters that um, are special or unique and have environmental matters been fully considered? I mean, here, um, since these are, uh, you know, federal uh, leases, um, you know, they're subject to NEPA. And so, um, you know, as we'll get into a little bit, if we have time, uh, the, the NEPA process is, is, is quite a long one if you have a environmental impact statement, um, which Vineyard had. Uh, uh, but the nice thing about Vineyard, of course, is that um, uh, that environmental impact statement essentially provided a roadmap for the development of the entire Northeast uh, offshore wind uh, industry. And so that uh, that created sort of what I'd say like a roadmap. And so while that project had to bear that time, you know, it was, it was time that essentially was well spent for the industry. Um, uh, so we can get into that a little bit. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so tax equity financing. That's the principal source of repayment for um, these for the construction debt. So therefore important uh, uh, for project finance. And so when we say we're project finance lawyers, we're looking at you know the credit of, of the project itself, but the takeout as well. And so we need to understand what the tax equity market is doing and what the and, and what the strategy is. And, and oftentimes we're lending into a tax equity commitment uh, uh, for a funding to be to be given later, typically in an ITC scenario between mechanical and substantial completion. Um, uh, so there's different types of tax credits. I, I won't get into this too much, but typically uh, uh, your wind, your offshore wind is going to be taking you know the, the investment tax credit. Um, which typically is uh, equal to 30% of the eligible cost uh, of that facility. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, right. And so the typical way that, um, you know, those tax credits are monetized by uh, a project sponsor um, is essentially to bring in a tax equity investor to participate, um, it's called tax equity because essentially um, uh, uh, the tax equity is participating as an equity investor in the project um, in order to essentially get the tax credits allocated to them. Um, and you know that tax equity investor um, provides cash <laughs> and that cash typically goes to, to repay the, the debt um, uh, that's, that's, and, uh, there may be some left over for the sponsor, but, but, um, uh, the tax equity investor then sort of has their principal, uh, form of repayment for that investment, um, in the form of tax credits. Um, and for an ITC project, they usually get that, you know, in year one. Um, but then they have to stay in the structure for, um, you know, at least five years for the recapture period. And they also get some other sort of minimum return that's required. And then there's a flip date. Um, and what happens at the flip date is um, the uh, percentages, the ownership percentages between the sponsor and the tax equity uh, flip. And the sponsor is typically at that point able to buy out the um, uh, the tax equity investor um, uh, for us usually five percent of the project, and so that's that's at fair market value. Uh, so next slide, please. So this is this is what I was just talking about. This is the the typical partnership flip structure. And I think these slides will be available to folks later, um, uh, which they provide a lot more detail than I think I have time to get into. Um, so ne next slide. So this is what I was talking about when I was talking about um, when you know various investors come in. So at the beginning, you know, you have everything ready to go. You're, again, project contracts 
your permits, uh, your construction contracts, and you get money from a financial institution. And that financial institution makes, uh, uh, provides a construction facility at the, at the financial close. Um, and then you start building the project. And the project continues to get built until the project reaches mechanical completion. Um, and mechanical completion, essentially, in layman's terms, uh, is that is that time where the project is basically fully constructed. Um, maybe there's some punchless items and some other things that um, uh, um, need to get finished. Uh, but but the the critical piece uh, is uh, and there's some testing that needs to happen. But the critical piece that has not occurred is that the project is not sort of plugged in and synchronized to the grid. Um, and it's important for uh, in an ITC context, again, investment tax credit context, it's important for the investor to come in in that interim period between um, mechanical and substantial before the system's plugged into the grid. That's critical. And so um, that's what happens. <laughs> they come into the they come into the uh, the project typically at sort of um, you know twenty percent of the overall investment, the project gets further completed, gets plugged into the grid. Um, again, maybe there's some punchless items that need to get finished. And for offshore, there's going to be a lot of punchless items. Um, but then they make their final um, uh, uh, investment at substantial completion. Um, so next slide, please. So we talked about what you need as a construction financing party uh, to uh, to get comfortable, and so the the normal the normal structure is to try to line up your tax equity commitment at the time of financial close, at the time that the construction financing is closed. That's important because again, that's the takeout for the construction financing. Typically, um, um, tax equity investors um, do involve do typically uh, need a sponsor guarantee to cover certain obligations, including recapture risks. Um, and uh, there are, but the tax equity investor typically is taking on um, structural risk. Related to the to the tax treatment uh, uh, of the um, of and 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 the structure itself, that's different than transferability, which we can we, we can get into a bit. Um, uh, the other issue is if you um, have the the lender staying on, um, and the lender can stay on in two ways. First of all, the lender is going to be staying on between mechanical and substantial completion. So that's because because the tax equity is not going to be fully funded in that period. And so that's one scenario. The other scenario is that for these sort of large projects, there's often often what uh, you know a term term financing piece, and that term financing piece typically is one level up from or, or two levels up from the. Um, a tax equity uh, on on the sponsor side, um, so that so the, so there needs to be a forbearance essentially between, uh, agreement between the lender um, and the tax equity investor, um, which will does one thing uh, that's very important, and it 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 typically prevents sort of recapture, um, uh, and recapture is sort of that you have to you know pay back the tax credit to the IRS. So you need that forbearance agreement if you are, uh, you know, a tax equity investor from the lender. Next slide. Um, okay, so that's kind of tax equity structures one on one. Leslie thankfully covered a lot of the current market conditions, so I think we can zip through these. Um, next slide, please. Um, so these are sort of this is these are some stats about 
you know, offshore wind and development in the United States. Um, I think we Leslie cover most of these. Less next slide. Um, these these are some details about um, offshore wind in New York and sort of the plant capacity here. Um, the last point is is very important in this slide. Um, so um, next slide, please. Um, uh, uh, well, next slide. Okay. So I would say the point about contracting is very important. Um, and there are, there are significant challenges in the offshore wind market and significant reasons why the costs for developing and construction, constructing offshore wind projects has increased. Um, one is, is permitting, you know, permitting takes a long time, including the federal permitting process. Um, uh, especially the sort of environmental review required by NEPA. As I, as I mentioned, though, I think that that, um, that particular process um, uh, will be shortened for future projects because of, uh, unfortunately, the pain that the vineyard had to go through, which was sort of the programmatic look at the entire Northeast United States um, waters and, and mapping out um, the plan for offshore wind um, in those waters. And I think that is going to be something that really um, uh, helps projects going forward. Um, the interconnection process can be can be long, uh, um, and it depends obviously on the market, um, whether it's, you know, NISO or PJM. Uh, um, and that's, <laughs> we, that's a whole nother topic, so we won't get into that. Um, next slide, please. Um, a lot of money is needed. Um, uh, there are sort of interesting legal issues related to financing offshore wind. So, for example, I remember I was doing a deal and representing a sponsor and we were getting development financing. And one of the questions that came up is, well, how do you get a mortgage in the middle of the ocean? Right? Uh, it's not a piece of land. Um, and the, the answer is, whoa. Where do we look? We 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 went and called a bunch of lawyers in, in Louisiana, uh, who knew about offshore uh, oil drilling, and lo and behold, uh, they told us how to get a mortgage in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> and so, uh, but there's all sorts of issues like that that um, you know just wouldn't come up on onshore development, and that are quite unique. Um, uh, Jones Act, of course, uh, the need the need for sort of U.S. ships and U.S. flagships. Um, it's uh, that 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 creates all sorts of challenges. Again, that's a whole nother topic. Um, next slide, please. I think one other thing I would say is that um, tax the tax equity market um, is going is going to be constrained going forward and it's for offshore wind projects in particular. Um, and that's because of a couple of reasons, you know, Leslie said, I think Leslie, you said it was $18 billion was last year. Correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, but that that's, and, and the need is 50 billion a year, right? So that's a big Delta. And if you think about the financial institutions and the way they approach their clients, you know, they, they're going to allocate that tax equity first to, you know, known sponsors that have known projects with known technology that have a track record that is stellar. And that that's going to be their first stop, right? And then at, only after that, are they going to look at the remaining capacity and say, where, where do I want to put this remaining remaining capacity? Do, do I want to put it in in offshore wind? And so there's a large question, you know, at least in the industry's mind as to, you know, given all the renewable energy that is being developed onshore um, and all the challenges you know, associated with offshore, is tax equity going to be available in a major way um, uh, to support this industry? Um, and 
you know, some people think yes, some people think no. But I think there there are you know, transferability is going to open up. At least we see is going to open up lots of different possibilities. And for transferability, you know, essentially the way those structures are working out now, um, you know, the sellers are taking on a lot of the structural risk and a lot of the risks related to, um, you know, the tax credits, but they're getting, you know, that's why there's being like an insurance, a big insurance market that is growing to support those transactions. Um, and um, so we're, we're seeing a lot of those deals um, already. And I think that's going to be a big piece um, of the market going forward. Can we uh, go to the next slide, please? Um, okay, we talked about, da, da, da. I think let's keep going. One more slide. Okay, that's it. So, uh, so I, I, uh, I think now is the time to turn it back over to Greg and, and um, uh, Leslie and I can try to answer some of your questions. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Leslie. Um, we do have we do have various questions that have come in through the chat, and um, um, if you've got if you've got any others, uh, please feel free to to serve them up. You know, I, I guess the as a as a general question, and perhaps Leslie would address this first one to you. You know, given um, why do we think that investors continue to be interested in offshore wind? Given that the levelized costs uh, for the, off, particularly the offshore wind projects, uh, are noticeably higher than other forms of uh, of energy. Uh, thank you, Greg. So, so I think um, you know the uh, the levelized cost of of energy has experienced a increase uh, recently. A lot of this is due to um, some. You know, just temporary market issues. I think over the longer term, as we've seen with the onshore um, wind and onshore so solar, there have been significant cost declines as these technologies have scaled. I um, also mentioned that you know offshore wind does require significant upfront investment, but investments um, these investments offer long term stable returns. Um, they have long lifespans, twenty five to thirty years. Um, and can provide a you know consistent and reliable source of, of revenue for investors. Uh, Chris, anything you want to add there? Yeah, I think it's not about the levelized costs; it's about the rate of return. And so, um, you know, tax equity investors historically um, have gotten uh, uh, a pretty high rate of return relative to financing parties uh, uh, in the bank markets. Um, and that's primarily because it's a constrained market. Um, uh, so it'll be interesting to see um, if transferability changes that. Um, and uh, if, uh, uh, you know, that that sort of compresses tax equity returns um, going forward. <laughs> You know, given given that, Chris, I guess another question that's come in is: Do you think there is su sufficient tax appetite, uh, tax equity appetite, to fully utilize uh, up to a fifty percent ITC for offshore wind? If you add the uh, add the bonus, the bonus uh, ITC. Um, well, not not currently. <laughs> yeah. So, so the question is, where is it going to come from? Um, so, well, I think there's two parts to your question. The first question is or where it's going to come from, the additional tax equity needed. Um, I think historically we have taken the position, um, uh, you know, I, I've done this at my own law firm. You know, we've got a number of Fortune, you know, 100 clients, et cetera. And, and, and it's been like pulling, te like pulling teeth trying to, uh, you know, get people into the tax equity market because, because it's not, Folks, this core business, uh, in, you know, these financial institutions, it is, um, and so they understand uh, how to structure these deals. They're willing to do the diligence. They're willing to hire uh, good advisors and counsel. Um, and uh, so, it's hard to see, you know, that traditional tax equity market opening up uh, uh, in the way that would be needed. But I think transferability just sort of changes the game. 
we are we're just seeing i mean i think personally i'm seeing just tons of deal activity and this is you know for tr traditional renewables but but you know the the major corporates you would expect are all interested and um uh and all and all looking to sort of sign up transactions now those there those transactions come with uh you know significant um, issues for the sponsor, for example, they have to figure out what they want to do with the depreciation and, you know, a lot of, you know, I talk, talk too much more, I'm going to get over my skis and have to call my tax lawyer in, but that, that's sort of, you know, that's where the market is right now. And I think, you know, it, it, some combination of expanding the traditional sort of structural tax equity market and this transferability piece is, um, you know, that, that seems like where it's coming from. Um, and if I if I could just add on to that, too. Um, so, you know, we do anticipate banks will continue to play an important role in providing tax equity. We work with many of them who are, you know, planning to increase their, um, you know, their tax equity investments in the market. There's also opportunity to bring in more players to tr traditional tax equity arrangements. And just with emerging technologies, um, you know, like offshore wind, the established structure of, of tax equity can be very attractive and in that it, it does, you know, provide the value of depreciation, but there's also due diligence and, and other services that, that tax equity investors provide, you know, and, and like Chris said, the transferability market will open up a lot of potential, um, you know, to kind of fill in for, for the rest of the, um, the demand. Okay. Shifting gears a little bit, uh, Chris, um, having run a project finance department, your your overview of project finance, I think, was um, was uh, was excellent here in your presentation. But given the uh, long lead time, I don't long long lead time. I'm sorry um, to develop an offshore uh, wind project, and the requirement for substantial upfront investment uh, to to fund. Um, Long lead items and things of that nature. Um, can you give uh, our our um, uh, our viewers here uh, some feel as to what happens when, uh, as happened in New York State, the PSC refuses to increase the total amount of of um, the total amount contracted for? What happens to all that upfront investment when you've got a a um, a, a potential renegotiation on, on those types of contracts? Yeah, I think it depends on the nature of the sponsor and the nature of the capital that's been raised. So, um, uh, just speaking kind of high level, you know, there are different types of sponsors that are participating. There's traditional renewable energy developers. There are oil majors, right? And there are uh, um, some uh, some private equity uh, uh, institutions as well that are, or infrastructure funds that are participating. And so that that's kind of the current mix. Uh, oh, I would add utilities. There's some, some, some unregulated utilities as well. So that's, that's the current mix. And you could sort of think, well, who's the most patient capital um, and who's going to take, you know, the longest term view. Um, I think historically that is thought to have been the majors. Um, uh, but we'll see, you know, it's, 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 um, you know, they, they the majors are making so much money on their, um, <laughs> the oil and gas business, um, that, um, you know, it's a question, uh, whether they continue to be, uh, as supportive, uh, as they have been, um, uh, to this industry. Um, I, I it, it's just open a question in my mind, um. Uh, maybe they continue to be very supportive, and I know that, you know, there's a push um, to embrace energy transition, including offshore, and they have the experience in the offshore oil and gas industry, which is very translatable. Uh, so, um, uh, just I well, I guess what I go back and say it's a very good question <laughs> uh, after I, outlining all that. Um, so, but there's less patient capital. Which um, is going to have to deal with, you know, deal with some of these issues um, one way or the other. Um, Janet, do we have time for a couple more questions here? Let's do one more. Thank you, Greg. Okay. Thank you. Okay. In 
Leslie, how do you how do you think we can attract non traditional investors to enter the offshore um, wind sector? So I think um, there's tremendous opportunity here um, to attract non traditional investors. I think that you know companies and investors who are motivated by sustainability or ESG related objectives, um, investing and engaging in the offshore wind um, sector would be a um, great way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and um, otherwise support, um, uh, you know, uh, clean energy technology um, that creates climate opportunities. Um, so, you know, we just see a lot of opportunity as, you know, as there's growing standardization um, from the regulators and climate disclosures and just how companies are needing to report on sustainability information and manage their sustainability objectives that um, these these are the types of investors that could be funneled into this space and of course um, those attracted by the tax credits and the transferability market as well. Thank you, Leslie. Um, and thank you all uh, for joining us for learning from the experts uh, for, uh, for the uh, for, for this learning uh, from uh, from the experts webinar. There's just a reminder that the webinar recording and presentation slides will be available uh, on NYSERDA's website. Uh, our next webinar in the series will be on November 8th um, and it would to cover how offshore wind farms are installed. You can register for future webinars through our events page at wind.ny.gov. Uh, we also encourage you to check out past webinars in the series on NYSERDA's website and YouTube, and YouTube ch channel. If you have any uh, requests for future topics you would like to hear about in the, in the series, please email us at uh, offshorewind at nyserta.ny.gov or fill out our Learning from the Experts survey posted on our website. Thank you for joining us today and uh, we look forward to seeing you on, um, on November 8th. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you, uh, Chris. Thanks so much, Greg, it was great. Great to be Thank here. Thank you.